In 2006, the Association of American Law Schools established the AALS Award for Lifetime Service to Legal Education and the Law. The, the, it's an award that's presented only every three years. The award was designed to recognize lifetime service to legal education by an outstanding faculty member or retired member of a AALS member school. The 2006 award was pre prevented, presented to Norman Dorson, the New York U University School of Law. 2009 award was presented to the Honorable Guido Calabresi of the United States Court of Appeal for the Second Circuit. The 2012 award was presented to the late Derek Bell, New York University School of Law. And the 2015 award was presented to Herma, Herma Hill Kay of the University of California, Berkeley School of Law. Today, we honor Professor, Professor Michael A. Levis of the University of Houston Law Center with the 2018 <coughs> Award for Lifetime Service for Legal Education and the Law. I'd now like to introduce Professor Paul Marcus of William & Mary Law School to say a few words about Michael. Thanks very much, Wendy. Maybe more than a few words, kind of hard to describe Michael with just a few words, I think. We gather here today, as you, as you just heard, to honor one of our own with the ALS Triennial Award. Um, as you know, just heard, uh, the award has only been given four times in our history. Um, these are all uh, individuals we've admired greatly, Norman Dorson, Guido Calabrese, Derek Bell, and Herma Hill Kay, all truly outstanding members of our community. The task of the a Executive Committee of the ALS this year was to see if any current member of our profession would measure up to these individuals and justify the giving of our most important award. We would need someone who has had a long career as a distinguished scholar, an outstanding teacher, and a great public servant. That's the ideal. Could we find such a person? Well, he's right there in the front row. Michael Olivas, the Bates Distinguished Chair in Law, Director of the Institute for Higher Education Law and Governance of the University of Houston, he is precisely the right person to receive this award. Now, Michael followed the usual route into law teaching, just the norm. He received his bachelor's degree from Pontifical College Josephinium in Ohio and planned on becoming a priest. Sounds so familiar for all of us, doesn't it? So many of us, right? He went on to receive a master's degree in English from the Ohio State University and stayed on for a doctorate in higher education and organizational theory. And his law degree, oh, that came from Georgetown University. He joined the law faculty from the, of the University of Houston more than 30 years ago, and he has truly distinguished himself as a scholar, not in one field, but in two, education law and immigration law. His teaching skills are widely <coughs> praised, and he has provided service in both law and higher education. Most recently, he served with great distinction is our president of the ALS, and also as president of the University of Houston downtown on an interim basis. Upon entering law teaching, Michael quickly established a reputation as a bit of a, now this comes from one of our mutual friends, Michael. Uh, he described you as a bit of a prickly individual. You can <laughs> probably guess who that was. He worked with Hispanic Bars, National Bar Association to release and circulate an annual list outlining the lack of Latino and Latina faculty members at law schools. According to Michael, when I started teaching, there were only 22 of us, and five of them were at the University of New Mexico. Michael continued to publish his list of the 12 worst outlaw law schools each year for over a decade, the Dirty Dozen, resulting in far greater emphasis on the need to open up law teaching to all qualified candidates. As a teacher, scholar, and public servant, there's much to be said as to the superb efforts of Michael over these last several decades. It is his work, however, as a mentor that I wish to focus on today. Because in my judgment, it is as a mentor that Michael Olivas may well have made his greatest contribution. And lest you take my word for this, let me tell you what I heard from teachers across the nation and from many, many of his former students. I reached out to them and they were enthusiastic in telling me of their respect for Michael Olivas and the impact he has made upon them. And let me quote to you 
from our fellow professors. I would say that Michael has been indispensable to the success of so many careers in the academy. He could start his own law school, or two or three, consisting solely of the professors he has mentored over the years. Michael is the most tireless and generous academic of any discipline, taking literally hundreds of junior and senior faculty members under his wing. As just one of his many, many mentees, I owe him an incalculable debt. Michael is the dean of Latino law professors, a term of endearment we use because he is responsible for so many of us being in the academy. What is most dynamic and unforgettable about Michael is that he set the bar for all of us with his ever-present and unyielding efforts to assist us. He has always been available on weekdays, weekends, and in the wee hours of the night to assist, cajole, and encourage. Michael Levis seems to have telepathic powers, telephoning or emailing us when he believes we might be running astray. He was almost always correct in his suspicions. In my case, I simply owe him everything, said one member of our profession. He was always present for us, but he was not easy on any of us. Indeed, he lived by the stick as much as by the carrot, but all came from love. <laughs> simply put, Michael was unyielding in his demands for excellence. Thank you, Professor Olivas. We all love and owe you so much. Michael Olivas helped me to earn tenure and has supported me ever since as a scholar and a law school dean. He once invited me to give an endowed lecture at the University of Houston Law Center, even though we both knew that there were scores of law professors better suited to the task and honor. At great personal cost, Professor Olivas' dirty dozen list led to the increased hiring of Latina and Latino law professors across the country. Michael is a prolific and sharp intellectual of sheer brilliance in substance and in style. His monumental scholarly achievements are paired with his extraordinary selflessness as reflected in his engagements inside and beyond the academy. Michael Olivas has been an instrumental mentor whose generosity and dedication to education has positively impacted my own <coughs> academic trajectory. Those are from law professors. Michael, I also talked with quite a number of your former students, and here's what a few of them have to say. Dr. Olivas' enthusiasm for the subject matter in his class was infectious from the first moment. Taking his immigration class in 1992, yeah, you really have been around for a long time, you know? <laughs> this person writes, taking that class would not only introduce me to one of the finest professors in the country, but would also pave the way for my own legal career. This experience served as the base to my becoming an immigration judge, and I know I would not be where I am today without Dr. Olivas' direction. As a first-generation college graduate, I often felt overwhelmed and out of place in law school. Many of my classmates were children of attorneys or had established connections in the legal community. In contrast, I found myself without a mentor to rely upon when I entered law school. That changed the moment I met Dr. Olivas. He gave me the confidence I needed to succeed. <laughs> Professor Olivas did so much more than teach or write books, he inspired his students to excel. When I think back to the seemingly endless conversations I had with him about my coursework, my career plans, my concerns, I'm amazed he did not pick up and run in the opposite direction whenever he saw me coming. I wouldn't have been able to work as a lawyer and later start my own law firm without Professor Olivas seeking me out early in law school. He actively pushed me along. As the first in my family to go to law school, that first push made all the difference. If ever there is a person that embodies and defines the word mentor, I believe that person is Michael Olivas. And finally, Professor Michael Olivas represents the best in higher education. He is a true gift to the legal community. I am forever grateful to him for sharing his wisdom and his kindness. Michael, all of us here today are forever grateful to you for sharing your wisdom and kindness to so many across our nation. Friends, it is my distinct honor to present the ALS Triennial Award to the all-time rock and roll <coughs> law professor. Ms. Thomas, if you would cue the music, please.
Tonight I'm going to turn back into a pumpkin as soon as this is over. Uh, those of you who have <clears throat> not seen me recently, I um, am scheduled to have knee surgery, but I do want you to know that I'm taking the pain like a man. <laughs> Badly. <laughs> mostly, mostly with whining and crying. <clears throat> also, this is not a um, President Clinton impersonation. I actually am recovering from a cold. It was four degrees in Santa Fe when we left yesterday, and I'm paying the price. First, I want to uh, point out the reason that Professor Leo Martinez is here, my fellow Santa Fe, New Mexican. Uh, it's his job to handle the recount <laughs> that, that I've called for. I actually started out as the Susan Lucci of the association. I was nominated and considered 17 times, count them, not that I kept track or anything, before I was named to the executive committee. Um, in my entire life, um, things have, have come in threes for me. I'm, I'm by, uh, by birth a, a Roman Catholic, mostly culturally Catholic these days, but uh, nonetheless. And as Paul pointed out in his ever-lying, exaggerating style, <laughs> uh, I did study to be a Catholic priest for eight years high school and college. Um, I was the death of seminaries in this sense. After the Vatican Council in 1964, the year I entered the seminary in Santa Fe, New Mexico, Immaculate Heart of Mary Seminary, uh, they, the, the church decided to eliminate high school seminaries. <laughs> and so every year, they would eliminate the class that I had completed. I took that personally for a long time until they also closed the College of Santa Fe, where I began my college career. And then it turned out the most esteemed graduate of the Pontifical College Josephinum, where I was um, uh, sent after, was the Cardinal Bernie Law of Boston, who used to be on our website <laughs> until, as you know, he had his fall from grace. It turns out that Although I loved being in the seminary, and I particularly loved the academic community that was there, and I have two colleagues who are former federal judges and, and lawyers, canon lawyers, former general counsel of NPR, and so forth, um, it turned out that I was so much better at afflicting the comfortable than I ever was at comforting the afflicted. <laughs> but it did single me out for a calling, a sense of what I was going to do with my life uh, as a calling. And I actually took a leave from the seminary to decide whether or not I would return. And upon graduate school, I, I found my, my calling and decided never to return. Although I get my seminarian colleagues together twice a year and we swap lies and, and, and so forth. But there are three things that I want to single out very, very briefly to you while Leo conducts the recount. First, have Barbara Ellenboss write your obituary or your nomination story. She, she is the person who, as Peter Winograd, is, is Peter here today? Peter, uh, Peter Winograd. As he pointed out, he calls me Molivas for some misbegotten reason. He says, Molivas, you had six out of eight pages in the newsletter. It, it, is, it is true, I hadn't really kept count, but I always have Peter, of course, to, to make sure. And he wanted to know why, why there was something not mentioned about me on the other two pages. Sort of like my father who once pointed out when I brought, my lowest grade that I brought home was a 94. And he said, well, yeah, but that was in theology and you want to be a priest. <laughs> no coddling kids in the Savino Olivas family, let me, let me just say um, so, Barbara, if things don't work out in legal education, you certainly have a job um, in the obituary section because I felt enshrined by the wonderful shout out that you had there. Um, secondly, have Paul Marcus gild the lily or um, um, state your case for you. Um, he and I both served together on the executive committee, and as with so many other wonderful intersections of my life, I prospered from that friendship. 
And then third, and this is probably most notable when you see who's received this award, live long and prosper. <laughs> as Leonard Nimoy used to say, a science officer Spock on Star Trek. And I always have to add the last part because my students, when I talk in, about great immigration movies, don't even know Godfather part one or two. And so I always show it up there and put it on social media so they'll actually recognize it and they can say they went to a movie. It's just pathetic. <laughs> Most of them don't even know who Van Morrison is. I mean, good Lord, please. Now, third, I, I got a call from, from or a, a, a note from Guido Calabresi, um, who I studied as a tort scholar, who I knew as a Yale dean, and who, of course, whose appeals I read um, in the, the Second Circuit, where he's taken senior status, of course, as befits all of those who receive this award. <laughs> I'm entering senior status to an extent. And I started out, I was hired when I was 30 years old, and for nine years I was the youngest person on the University of Houston faculty, even though it had hired about 20 people, I was just simply so young. That, of course, takes care of itself over time, <laughs> uh, let, me, let me just say. Note to self, always take better care of your knees than, than I did. So Guido writes me and he says, Michael, welcome to the club. And I, he, he has an Italian accent and I adore people who speak English with accents. And so I wish we had actually spoken. But he says, I've been waiting for another member since all the other awardees have passed. <laughs> another form of senior status that I am assured will come to all of us, no matter our profession. And he said, Michael, you've got to hang on until January. And I said, well, you know, I, I have aspirations beyond that. <laughs> he said, yes, but I will have no more aspirations after that. So, um, Barbara, start cranking up the obituaries. <laughs> Truth is, Guido will probably outlive all of us. Also, have great mentors and mentees, or as I often call them, mentirosos. For those of you who do not speak Spanish or, or Latin, uh, a mentira is, is a lie. So I have mentees and mentirosos, many of whom, of course, exaggerate the influence I had upon them. Because as all of you certainly know, you learn as much from your students about life and the law. Uh, you think you've learned every case there is and every application, and you've held it up like the kaleidoscope that it is, and you've looked at And then a student says, well, what about a, B, and C, and you go, oh, God, I'll get, I'll get back to you on that. We need to move on. Uh, a device that I find I'm having to use a lot more often these days. So just as people said I was their mentor, I'd like to give a shout out to another person who's, who's passed, John Kramer, the law professor at Georgetown who took me aside out of all the unlikely evening students in his charge who said, Harry Chapin's coming to campus. You want to see him? <laughs> Harry Chapin, for those of you pathetic people who don't know, <laughs> was a rock and roller whose work I adored. And I must have said that at some point to John, who had filed it away. But it turned out he was a personal friend of Harry's. And so I actually met my very first rock star after meeting John Kramer, of course, um, in, the, in the person of, of uh, Harry Chapin. Because she was on maternity leave the year that I took family law, Judith Arene did not have the opportunity to correct me and point out other singers. She strikes me more as the kind of Peter, Paul, and Mary type than, <laughs> than Harry Chapin. But she became in real life not only my friend and mentor, but a fellow coup plotter and a couple of times almost a co-defendant <laughs> in some of our actions. Uh, if I'm going to be a co-conspirator with anybody, it will be Judith. And if it weren't Judith, it would be Susan Prager, who's a dear friend who also headed up uh, ALS at the time I was president. And speaking of ALS, I just cannot let this go without some personal shout-outs to the extraordinary staff, as, as Wendy noted earlier. Uh, this is a staff and volunteer-driven organization. And to have worked with Mary Cullen, Tracy Thomas, Barbara Studenman, 
Marisa, Ginger, Eric, and Jane LaBarbera, friends all, who have given so far beyond the measure, um, I offer you thanks, and if, if I am, have ever um, had any accomplishments with regard to ALS, it's because of the staff and the volunteer structure. As president, I worked with Susan, and I made 85 appointments to committees, task forces, tribunals, sister organizations, and only one turned me down. A friend from the law school in, in my state, New Mexico, who had just been named a tribal judge and who had new obligations, and she turned me down with great regrets and promised me if I ever asked her again, she'd say yes. Well, that time has passed. But 84 people, all of whom stepped up to the plate, who um, did the work that the organization requires, selflessly and generously, uh, and for the common good. Another lesson that harkens back to my life as a seminarian and would-be priest. I'm at the point in my career, which will formally end this coming summer as I retire with my beloved wife, Tina, to Santa Fe, where it was four degrees yesterday. I'm not, we're, Tina, we gotta think this through. <laughs> Maybe summer, I don't know, New Orleans or something, you know, winter in New Orleans, whatever. Um, I'm picking up my share of Lifetime Achievement Awards these days, making the rounds, and I sort of feel like Kareem Abdul-Jabbar when he retired. Every time he went to a new um, basketball city to play his final game, they gave him a rocking chair. So what Paul really meant was I'm the rocker and roller <laughs> law professor. I also think that somebody must have talked with my doctor or something, and I need to go check why everybody's giving me all these lifetime achievements. I'm only 67. I think I've got a number of miles left on the chassis uh, after I fix this, this right knee tire. Um, or I'm going to turn back into the pumpkin that, um, that I will become in regular life. Justice Sonia Sotomayor came to the University of Houston not long ago, and she did so as a favor to me, a personal favor, which she said she would come before I retired. And I will tell you, that day, for about 22 hours, I was the hottest ticket in town, literally. I had friends calling, I had alums calling, I had people I didn't even know who wanted to know how I was, and my, and my wife, Christina. Not to be confused with my wife, Augustina one of whom asked for 11 tickets. Whereupon I told her, I can give you one, and, and the, rest, the other 10 are gonna have to be in the, the watch room. And then she got mad at me and said, well, you know, I'm, I'm probably not gonna give any more to the University of Houston. Whereupon I checked, and what do you think are the odds that she'd never <laughs> given a penny? <laughs> but she sent bad vibes. So Leonard, if our fundraising <laughs> suffers, I'll, I'll tell you the name and we can do something about that. I cannot imagine, other than the theological life, a life better than being a law professor. Everybody in this room knows this ineffable truth that being a law professor is a great gig. And if you ever decide to leave it, it better be for a much better job with better tenure even than has occurred. It provides the personal and the extrinsic values that all of us require, and we should not slight the value of this profession or not take it seriously and honor it. It nourishes us and in turn all our mentees and mentirosos. <clears throat> to those of us with talents, there are biblical admonitions that we should give to others, and there's never a profession like that better than being a law professor. I have been a very lucky boy all these years. When I started out, there were not even case books in higher ed law or immigration law. That's how long ago, in 1982, when I started. My first ALS was in Cincinnati in 1983, a town that we couldn't even hope to host ALS in anymore. It's so small. We're stuck with the big cities, big hotels, big conference centers. <coughs> Tonight, today, tonight, 
I feel very much like Tom Sawyer and Huck Finn at the funeral, looking down on the proceedings with Becky crying over here and all my other friends, remembering what a good boy I was, only to, to correct the record when it turned out they were both still alive. For those of you who I haven't had a chance to, to uh, see personally, uh, please come to the University of Houston Law Center reception in the Kasakoff room at 7 o'clock tonight so that I can properly spend time with you. It's been a wonderful 37 years, and I can't imagine leaving on a better note than this. Um, I don't want rocking chairs, but I do intend to, con to continue my Law of Rock and Roll show on NPR on Friday mornings, which you can listen to on KUHF on, on Saturday nights, or KANW, Albuquerque's public radio station, uh, on Friday mornings at 9 o'clock Mountain Standard Time. Thank you all very much. I appreciate it. I love all of you. Thank you so much for this wonderful life that you've given me. Thank you. Thank you.